Hello, everyone, and welcome to Diversigen's webinar on viral metagenomics. Um, joining us, we're really glad that you can join us, and I think everyone is here, so we'll get started. So, my name is Lisa Gamwell. I'm a product manager at Diversigen. I'll be your moderator today, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers. We have with us Dr. Emily Hollister. She's the Director of R&D Computational Biology at Diversigen. And we also have Tasha Santiago Rodriguez, who is a data scientist at Diversigen. Today, Tasha and Emily will be talking to us about viral metagenomics. They'll be talking about the biases and the use of reference materials, and also some potential applications. After they speak, we'll have about 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A buttons at the bottom of your screen to ask questions at any time. So without further, further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Emily and Tasha. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm joined with, by Dr. Tasha Santiago Rodriguez and today we'll be speaking about viral metagenomics, opportunities, challenges, and applications. The plan for today is to give a quick overview of Diversigen, who we are and where we came from, cover an introduction to viral metagenomics and its applications, discuss biases in bi viral metagenomics, the application of reference materials for the development of viral metagenomics pipelines and tools, as well as potential applications of viral metagenomics in the detection and ongoing um, future pathogenic hum human viruses. One that comes to mind certainly is SARS-CoV-2. However, we fully expect that lessons learned during the current pandemic will apply to future applications. So jumping in, Diversigen was founded in 2014 by Dr. Joe Petrosino and uh, started as a spin out and a portfolio company from Baylor College of Medicine. You'll notice there are two companies highlighted here, both Diversigen and Core Biome. Core Biome was founded in 2016 by Drs. Kenny Beckman, Daryl Legol, and Dan Knights at the University of Minnesota. And in 2019, both companies were acquired by Orishore Technologies and have since joined forces under the Diversigen banner, bringing together the best of both worlds in terms of quality, service, and innovation in, in the microbiome services space. We're also a part of a larger uh, family of, of companies under the Orishore Technologies umbrella, including DNA Genotech, Novasanis, Yorshore, and the Orishore Technologies parent company. So jumping into viral metagenomics and its applications, first I'll actually speak about the bact bacterial metagenomics. A figure like this will likely be familiar to many and the steep rise in its curve or the red line represents the number of microbiome publications as found by the uh, keyword search microbiome in PubMed over the course of the last roughly 20 years. Microbiome studies have exploded in both number and, and variety since the founding and stop funding rather of the Human Microbiome Project and MetaHit around 2007. You'll notice a blue line in this figure as well. And that represents um, studies with the keyword virome in them. Although it looks very shallow relative to the red line that focuses largely on, on the bacterial portion of the microbiome, you'll see that if we zoom in, there's actually a very steady increase in the number of virome related publications since 2006. Interest in the virome is, in, is increasing and certainly um, viruses in particular have received a lot of attention in 2020. But the part of the reason for the lag in virome publications relative to bacterial microbiome publications has to do with technical challenges. Viruses tend to be a bit more difficult to study. They lack a universal gene like the 16S ribosomal RNA gene or ITS2 that is commonly used in amplicon uh, profiling of bacterial and fungal communities. Viruses can be DNA or RNA, double-stranded or single-stranded, making their, their comprehensive capture a little bit more challenging. Additionally, although viruses are numerically abundant, they tend to have very small genomes and the proportion of, of nucleic acid present in a mixed community like a microbiome tends to be relatively low. So without using um, enrichment strategies, viruses can often be difficult to capture. Additionally, we know that our databases, our reference databases in particular, tend to be biased toward pathogens in known phage. 
which makes um, characterization of viral communities a little bit more difficult and tends to narrow our focus to those things we know about rather than leaning toward um, the discovery of novel viruses. But why are viruses important and why are they interesting? Um, viruses are found everywhere. Anywhere there are bacteria, you're likely to find viruses as well. And viruses can be found throughout the human body. Um, pick your favorite body site and there are interesting viruses to be found. We know that viruses, and in particular phage, uh, outnumber bacteria by a factor of about 10 to 1 in the human gut. And if we extrapolate that backward to some of the early estimations of the number of bacterial cells relative to human cells, it's really impressive to think about the viral content um, in, in and on the human body relative to the human genome and human, number of human cells themselves. We know that viral communities vary in the context of health and disease, even in the, in the present or rather absence of known pathogens. Viral communities um, may respond to changes in, in external factors, such as uh, the use of medications, diet, intimate contact, and other features or factors in our lives. And although we often refer to this as party tricks, um, viral profiles of stool can be used to provide insight into diet. It's not uncommon to look to find in a stool viral profile dairy associated phage and plant pathogens associated with some of our common staple fruits and vegetables. I can often take a look at a viral profile and tell someone whether they've been eating salsa or cucumbers recently. And I think even more fascinatingly, new studies are really beginning to shed light on the ability of the virome to influence human immune responses. Last year, there was a fascinating paper demonstrating the ability of a phage associated with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and its, and its in, uh, influence on the human immune system, particularly when wounds infected with a Pseudomonas aeruginosa carrying this P4 phage um, occurred, the, the, the phage um, essentially engineered the human or hijacked the immune response and prevented the body from clearing the infection. Whereas Pseudomonas aeruginosa infected wounds without the phage were, were cleared far more readily. We know that virus mediated approaches show incredible promise in treating antimicrobial resistant infections. And this is a whole area of phage therapy that is beginning to attract new and renewed attention. As, um, as, as medicine and uh, the treatment of infection is, is challenged with um, antimicrobial resistance and in, in, in growing numbers. And then finally, its new publications suggest that the virome may provide answers to microbially mediated phenomena where bacterial studies have come up short and there have been some fascinating results and, and studies published in the last couple of years suggesting that virome may be a factor or an indicator or perhaps a biomarker of the onset of disease, not only cancer, but also things like type 1 diabetes, which was demonstrated by a recent study of type 1 from the type 1 diabetes in the young cohort. Um, indicating that extended exposure to enterovirus B, B rather, may be an indicator for the onset of type 1 diabetes later in life. We know that viruses are acquired from birth and, and, um, and pass through, through vertical transmission from mother to child. And that influence or that relationship is continued to be influenced through the process of breastfeeding into early or into the infant year. Beyond that, we know that diet can also influence virome composition. And in particular, this study highlighted on the right-hand side found that in a mouse model, exposure to high-fat diet shifted the balance of ly lytic to lysogenic bacteria, suggesting that not only does the diet influence bacterial composition, but it may have additive effects in the way that it influences the viral um, community and therefore further influencing bacterial composition. Implications for this for human health are still not fully established, but it is really fascinating to think about the fact that when we influence one portion of the microbiome, we are likely influencing multiple aspects of it. 
Beyond that, we know that viruses, or we're learning that viruses are often present in body sites and matrices that were previously considered sterile. In human urine, in individuals who are otherwise considered healthy, um, viruses have been detected, including human papillomavirus. Very interestingly, this is one of the first studies to utilize next-gen sequencing to demonstrate the presence of human papillomavirus in urine. And none of the volunteers in this particular study were HPV, known HPV positive or had abnormal pap smears. Additionally, viral, viral components have been identified in cerebrospinal fluid. Again, a matrix that's typically considered sterile in the absence of infection. Finally, or not finally, but in addition to that, there's been, some, there's been some fascinating work done in blood. This was a, a, an extensive study of 8,000 humans and the DNA virome from blood in generally self-reported healthy individuals. Not only were herpes viruses and anella viruses as well as pox viruses found, there was also indication in some cases of recent influenza A vaccination. One of the other interesting features about this and something that Tasha will touch on in another portion of the talk is the fact that um, this study also highlighted the, the potential for background contamination and, and matrix effects to be detected, highlighting the need for um, controls and standards to be able to interpret signal from noise. As I mentioned, viruses are increasingly being um, thought of as an opportunity or a um, um, method for treating disease, and bacteriophage in particular are, can be harnessed for these applications. In this particular study highlighted here, um, in patients with alcoholic liver disease, uh, cytolysin positive Enterococcus faecalis was effectively treated with a phage targeting E. faecalis and was able to reduce symptoms associated with the liver disease showing tremendous promise for this as a potential therapy going forward. Finally, one of the last things I'll highlight is the fact that viruses have value both from an environmental and epidemiological perspective. If you've been following the news over the course of the last eight months, you'll certainly be familiar with many of the efforts um, in reports surrounding the detection of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. In particular, it's data is suggesting that it is a useful leading indicator for viral spread in communities, often giving approximately a seven day head start um, in terms of indicating which direction the viral virus is spreading in a community, whether case, case numbers are increasing or decreasing, and often providing a signal well before uh, patients become symptomatic which is incredibly useful from a public health perspective. Beyond that though, uh, viruses have been uh, suggested that they may be a useful tool for water quality monitoring. Current efforts for water quality monitoring often rely on fecal indicator bacteria, which may not be as sensitive or specific, depending on the particular targets and recommendations that organizations and municipalities are attempting to um, provide to their communities. So with that, we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about bi biases in viral metagenomics, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Tasha Santiago Rodriguez. Thank you, Emily. With viral research, although very interesting, as you saw, there are uh, different biases that can be introduced into, into the pipeline. And usually a virome pipeline includes several steps that are very similar to any microbiome study, including sample collection, sample processing, sequencing, and bioinformatics. While we don't really have a very good number of studies assessing the biases that can be introduced into each of these steps in virome research specifically, we can certainly learn lessons from microbiome research. Let's talk a little bit about some of these biases, particularly at sample collection. Sample collection is probably one of the first steps after uh, study design, and there are a number of different practices for sample collection that will depend on the sample type. For example, the sample collection methods for, let's say, uh, saliva and urine might not be the same as those for stool samples because of the differences in the nature of the samples, the matrix of the samples, and probably the amount of material needed for downstream applications. 
There were a series of experiments performed at DNA Genotech testing the capacity of omnigene gut to stabilize DNA viruses, particularly crassphage and bacteriophage D5 under different conditions. They tested the detection of these phages with no stabilization at baseline, at room temperature after 14 days, and also at minus 80 after 14 days. And they also tested the ability of omnigene gut to stabilize these viruses at baseline, also at room temperature after 60 days, at 50 degrees after three days, and they also tested various freeze-thaw cycles. In terms of the baseline information, no differences were noted in the CT values in any of the arms of the study. When looking at a crass phage, again, no differences were noted in any of the arms of the study, but when looking at bacterial phage T5, there was a significant decrease in CT values at room temperature after 14 days. These results indicate that while some viruses, as in the case of grass phage, may be more stable under different conditions, other viruses, as in the case of bacterial phage T5, may be more sensitive to changes in storing conditions. Therefore, I would suggest that each researcher will have to probably select the best sample collection and stabilization conditions depending on their own type of study. Sample processing is also essential in viral metagenomics and there are a number of different practices for sample collection that may include, for example, centrifugation, ultracentrifugation, filtration, deamplification of nucleic acids, just to mention a few of them. And this is a paper that is highly recommended for those of you trying to see the potential effects of different processing methods for viral metagenomics. So just to give you a little bit of information, the authors first put together a mock community composed mostly of DNA viruses, particularly bacteriophage lambda, here shown in black, the vaccinia WR virus, here shown in red, bacteriophage 529, here shown in light blue, the adenovirus, here shown in purple, bacteriophage M13, here shown in orange, the mice minute the virus B, here shown in pink, and also the porcin circovirus, here shown in green. And they had several different arms uh, to the study, including a control, uh, several filtration steps with 0.45 or 0.22 micromembranes, an iodixin occlusion step, and also they tested two different nucleic acid amplification methods, including CISPA, which is also known as sequence independent single primary amplification, and also MDA, which is known as multiple displacement amplification. I know it is a very complex study, but a couple of things stand out from the results. One of them is the reduction of the vaccinia WR virus you're shown in red when using the filtration method. The other thing that stands out is the overrepresentation of bacteriophage M13 here shown in orange when using the MDA method. If we zoom into each of the viruses when using either the MDA or the CISPA method, we see as expected an increased full change in the relative abundance. I know it's, it's, very, it's very complex, but the take home message is that really there is not a perfect method or methods for the detection of viruses and the processing of samples for uh, viral metagenomics. Therefore, I would suggest for each researcher, again, to select the best processing conditions depending on, on their own type of study. One of the ways to address some of these issues that we talk about is by applying or are introducing reference materials into the pipeline like, like mock communities to benchmark any reagents or any bioinformatic tools. But I would say that even after benchmarking all of the reagents and bioinformatic tools, it's going to be very important to keep adding these reference materials because there are still biases that can be introduced. For example, changing the technician from day to day or issues during shipping of the samples to the lab. All those things can affect the results from, from your biome study. And the only way to probably see these issues will be by adding some type of reference material. But the realization of including these reference materials like mock communities arose very recently, to the best of my knowledge, probably around 2012, 2013, maybe a little bit before that, when we were uh, moving from 454 sequencing to Illumina sequencing. But more and more researchers are acknowledging the fact that we need to add reference materials into our microbiome pipelines. But there are there is still room for improvement because, for instance, in articles published in, in two important microbiome and microbiology journals in 2018 alone show that 
Only 30% of those studies reported a negative control and only 10% of those studies reported the use of a positive control. The good news is that reference materials like mock immunities can be used as positive controls and sometimes they can be used as negative controls depending on, on your study. But again, as I mentioned, they are still not being implemented on a regular basis, even though they are available through institutions, laboratories, and even commercial facilities. As some of you may know, most of these uh, reference materials are intended for microbiome analysis, targeting the bacterial fraction of the microbiome, and very few have been developed specifically for viral research. The other good news is that there are some reference materials out there for viral research, particularly from the American Type Culture Collection or ATCC. And this is a white paper where Libertigen had the opportunity to collaborate. And just to give you a little bit of information, ATCC put together two types of mock communities, one of nucleic acids and another one of the whole viruses. And they added DNA viruses and also single-stranded and double-stranded uh, RNA viruses, as you can see here in, in this diagram. And again, as I mentioned, uh, Diversigen had the opportunity to beta test some of these mock communities. As you can see here, we tested the nucleic acid mock community. And once we received that sample, we converted the RNA to cDNA and that cDNA was pooled with the DNA and we had two arms for the library preparation process, one where the pool library would go through an extra only step and another one where that pool library went through an, an amplification using semi-random primers and we annotated the data using three annotation tools including Metaflan2 which is a marker-based analysis tool Kraken2, which is a Kamer-based analysis tool, and also Virma, which is highly dependent on databases. And as you can see here in this graph, the Nextera only arm of the study probably resembles more the expected proportions of, of the viruses in the Mark community. You can see, for example, also that Virma was probably the only annotation tool that was able to identify all viruses expected in the Mark community, because you can see that Metaflan 2 and Kraken 2 were not able to identify the real virus here shown in, in gray. And also you can see that there are a number of different biases that can be introduced when using these semi-random primary amplification. For example, you see an overrepresentation of the adenovirus here shown in green when using Metaflan 2 and also an overrepresentation of the influenza B virus here shown in like a light blue when using Kraken 2. In terms of the whole viruses, again, there are a number of different biases that were introduced. We only tested one kit. You can see, for example, an overrepresentation of the herpes virus here shown in, in a dark blue when using the next year only step, and also an, a bias towards the adenovirus here shown in green when using the semi random primers. But I would say that the take home message is that viral mock communities and this type of reference materials are very helpful when trying to identify biases that can be introduced during viral research. And now Emily Hollister is going to talk a little bit about some, some of the applications of, of viral metagenomics in, in some of the ongoing SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Thanks, Tasha. As Tasha mentioned, um, I'll be discussing some of the work that we've done to be able to detect and ensure the ability to detect SARS-CoV-2 in, met in viral metagenomic samples. However, the work we've done here certainly would apply to any future virus or of interest um, going forward. So, um, in specifically, as Tasha highlighted, um, the, the tool ViewMap, which is one of the, the primary tools we use in viral characterization um, as a, from a bioinformatics perspective, is highly database dependent. However, when it's, one of its really fascinating features is that it leverages both protein sequence and nucle nucleic acid sequence, nucleotide sequence, in its mapping to recover information as completely as possible. So, of course, this meant that we needed to update our databases earlier this year to be able to capture the novel coronavirus. Specifically, um, we sought to confirm that we were able to detect SARS-CoV-2 in known positive specimens, as well as suspected negative specimens based on the data collection. These were bronchial alveolar lavage specimens collected here, denoted by the WI, uh, 
sample of ID um, in Wuhan, China, as well as another Chinese uh, research institute. Um, the COPD samples are the suspected negative, again, based on sample date, or rather collection date. And using this uh, approach, this, these samples were all sequenced using um, essentially a metatranscriptomic type approach, an RNA-based sequencing approach. We were to be able to detect SARS-CoV-2 in known positive samples. We did not detect it in suspected negative samples, again, based on the date of sampling. But we were able to detect other viruses across all samples. Importantly, too, we spent time to be sure that we could differentiate the novel coronavirus from existing known coronaviruses, including MERS and other um, known coronaviruses. So as we think about the application of reference materials for SARS-CoV-2, this is absolutely critical as labs around the world have stepped up and rushed to attempt to address the current pandemic. Um, being able to use reference materials has aided labs in their ability to extract nucleic acids efficiently and um, address the shortage of reagents in some cases with novel extraction approaches, assess cDNA conversion efficiency, as well as track virus evolution, and be able to detract and be able to detect viruses in metagenomic uh, contexts. Although many applications are, are laser focused on the detection of SARS-CoV-2, certainly, certainly we know that there are other applications being developed, especially those that have a focus on broader respiratory, respiratory virus detection going into respiratory season this winter, um, in being able to detect and differentiate a SARS or CoV-2 infection versus influenza, RSV, or other respiratory viruses, and certainly assay debt validation and surveillance tools going forward, such as those being used to monitor wastewater or other public, public uh, resources and spaces. Beyond that, we would highlight that um, DNA Genotech has also been have, uh, busily at work validating and assessing the ability of their collection devices for SARS-CoV-2 research, whether it be for diagnostic purposes, um, at-home collection or, or remote collection, um, as well as, as research use purposes. Um, DNA Genotech has two uh, devices that have been provided with emergency use authorization, either through partners or direct authorization from the FDA, where these easy to use, all-in-one, non-invasive self-collection kits um, have been demonstrated to preserve RNA with high quality, as well as stabilize signal for downstream use and testing. If you're interested in these kits, please feel free to reach out to DNA Genotech for more information about them. And certainly going forward, as I mentioned earlier, we've all had a lot of focus placed around the, the current pandemic and SARS-CoV-2, but we fully expect that this year's lessons will translate to continued interest in, in some cases, new or renewed interest in viral metagenomics and viral metagenomics applications leading to ideally expansion of viral databases and surveillance through surveillance activities. As we look in more and more places, we find more and more viruses, including novel ones. Um, surveillance for zoonotic diseases, certainly veterinary medicine applications, particularly those focused around potential novel emerging and re-emerging pathogens. As we highlighted previously, continuing to identify novel relationships with health, and health disease and viruses, including those unexplained illnesses that have yet to be linked to a, a, a definitive cause, and the work that continues to be done to understand the effects of novel treatments on the microbiome and the virome as a component of that, including fe fecal transplantation, phage therapy, and novel medications. We fully expect to see that layering virome information into metagenomic studies and multiomic studies will provide new biological and clinical insights. And that as the field continues to develop and mature, much like we've observed in the microbiome space over the last 15 years, that we will see continued improvements related to collection, stabilization, extraction, the availability of new reagents and approaches, and certainly new and 
uh, differentiated comprehensive reference materials to help with the evolution of these processes and, and this work. Um, so with that, we would happily take questions. We hope you're ready to get started on your viral metagenomics study, and uh, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. All right. So I would encourage our audience to ask questions using the Q&A box below. Just getting the screen set up. Okay. So we've had one question in from the audience so far. I don't know, Emily or Tasha, if you can see that and if either of you would like to take it. Sure. Um, so the question had to do with, I'll see if I can pull it up again. Um, the question was um, regarding the ATCC study and um, the fact that we mentioned that map is very database dependent. Uh, the, quest, the question also highlights the fact that Kraken 2 is very database dependent as well and um, also relies on a variety of sensitivity parameters. Specifically, the question was, what database did we use? Was it something virus specific? And was the gray virus, uh, which is a Rio virus, present in the database? Um, I believe, it's been a while since we did that work, that we used the uh, Kraken, the, the pre-distributed Kraken database, which does contain a variety of viruses. Awesome. Okay, thanks, Emily. Sure. So while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, I have some of my own. Um, I apologize, I'm getting some feedback on the audio. I hope I'm the only one that can hear that. Um, all right, so. Let's go back to the very beginning. Emily, you showed a slide that viruses outnumber bacteria 10 to 1, yet the publication rate data shows that the field is predominantly focused on the bacterial proportion of the microbiome. Why do you think viruses have not been a major focus of academic research efforts? Well, certainly the field of virology has been around for quite a while, um, but in terms of studying viruses as, as a community, as I highlighted, there are a number of challenges associated with it. They are numerically abundant, but because they have relatively small genomes, um, their presence in the pool of nucleic acid can actually be quite a bit smaller. Additionally, um, we don't have as many tools or historically we haven't had as many tools for the study of these of viruses as a community so in the early days of microbiome research and microbial community characterization researchers relied very heavily on amplicon sequencing um, leveraging the 16s ribosomal rna gene back in the sanger days utilizing more or less full length 16s and then shifting to partial 16s amplicons as we shifted for, to 454 and then the Illumina platform. Because viruses are so varied and so diverse, there is no universal gene that allows for more or less comprehensive capture um, in an amplicon setting. So it really relied, getting, getting to full community characterization um, of the viral portion of the, of the community has relied on the maturation and development of uh, essentially shotgun metagenomic type approaches where we can capture the, the viral communities, um, capture the nucleic acids, and, and as Tasha highlighted, that often requires enrichment, and then have the databases and depth of sequencing available to be at, at cost to be able to capture all of that information. So it's been, it is kind of a culmination of, of gathering information. That's not to say that people haven't done it. And actually there is quite a, there are a number of viral metagenomic publications that have been um, uh, written more or less as a skimming activity. So taking transcriptomic sequencing, for example, from ho various hosts and pulling the viral fraction out of it essentially as bycatch, but as a way of, of surveying for diversity of viruses. So we've got a couple more questions in. Um, so the first one is, in order to maximize the amount of the virome, it seems that multiple sequencing steps would be necessary to identify DNA viruses, RNA viruses, et cetera. Is there any movement towards a single kit that can simultaneously sequence them all, or is it more likely that samples should be subdivided and processed and sequenced separately? I don't know who wants to take that one. 
I guess uh, if we look at the ATC CMOC community, that one had both RNA and DNA viruses. And in that case, what we did was to convert that RNA to cDNA and just pull everything together and then sequence. So I think as of now, Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe we can sequence uh, both DNA and RNA viruses uh, if we use some of the experiments from that mock community. Yep, absolutely. So um, there, I think there definitely is movement in the field toward getting to a single platform solution, although it's challenging. Um, so it does require total nucleic acid extraction and um, our our academic partners, um, the, the group that founded Diversogen, came up with a combined sequencing protocol, essentially um, adding a cDNA step and then sequencing total cDNA plus DNA to get at that full pool. Um, that's, it's a creative solution. It's perhaps not always a perfect solution, um, although it has proven to be very useful. So I do expect there to be more movement in this field going forward, especially given all of the interest around viruses um, this year and, and certainly going, going into the future. Ultimately, I think, you know, like many things, the answer is it depends. Are you interested in, in the total viral fraction? Are you interested in RNA viruses or DNA viruses? And questions along those lines may end up um, interrupting the, the approach that, that you end up taking. All right. So this is a question that I think is probably on a lot of people's minds. What's the confidence value on viral genomics and samples versus looking at isolated viruses. So if you're looking at COV2, for example, um, a similar question that I've got in my notes is, can you comment on the difference between the pipeline approach that you guys showed versus uh, a PCR-based SARS-CoV-2 detection? So maybe you just comment on that in general. Tasha, would you like to start or do you want me to jump in? Um, can you jump in? Sure. <laughs> um, right. So obviously, or maybe not obviously, but in many cases, a metagenomic recovered uh, genome often comes with a, 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 a question, you know, a number of questions around its, its completeness and its confidence. Um, ultimately, what we've seen is that it really depends on your depth of sequencing. Um, I've seen several examples and actually in the ones that we demonstrated uh, or that we showed as a part of our demonstration of our ability to detect the SARS-CoV-2 genome in known positive samples, the viral load in those samples, or at least what you know, what we interpret to be the viral load as a function of number of reads recovered varied dramatically from roughly 3x coverage at the lowest depth to over 100x coverage of the, the SARS-CoV-2 genome in some of the, the samples that appeared to have, well, they were sequenced very deeply, but also appeared to have the greatest viral load. So in that case, if you're, if you're recovering 100x um, on a genome, likely the, the confidence around the quality of it is pretty good. It also helps to have a reference to assemble back to, or at least map back to, and where you can look at where there are potential shifts or differences or, or variants. Um, and that certainly is something that, um, you know, people have been doing as they've been recovering these genomes. Other approaches around SARS-CoV-2 have been more targeted in their nature. Um, so going specifically for your positive negative with an RT-QPCR test or utilizing something like the Arctic protocol, which is more of a um, amplicon directed genome recovery. So using tiling amplicons to be able to pull the whole genome back out and then assemble it. So um, again, it really kind of, I think the answer is yes, you can get a high quality genome back out of this. Um, using an approach like this, but it can come at the, um, the expense right, or the drawback of, of you know, having to have that very deep sequencing to support it. Uh, whereas the other approaches tend to be more targeted in nature and um, can certainly get, you, at least the, the Implicon tiling can get you a, a good quality genome very quickly, um, but you lack the ability to see what else is there. Okay, maybe you can, <clears throat> kind of continue on that theme and comment on the downstream uses for those viral genomes. What are some of the things that you can do with that information? Sure. So we've seen a variety of applications. Um, in, in terms of recovering genomes, um, one of our collaborators at Baylor College of Medicine very early on in the pandemic 
uh, was very interested in trying to figure out origins, as, as, most, as many people were, right? Trying to figure out how the virus made the jump from um, animals or a wildlife population to humans. And uh, the application that he chose to, or the path he chose to pursue was actually taking transcriptomic data sets and, and viral metagenomic data sets from wildlife populations, specifically sourced in Asia, and it turns out there were about eight of them at the time, that he was able to find, or he profiled about eight of them before he found um, the very similar SARS-CoV-2 genome out of Pangolin. Um, from that, he was able to recover a near complete genome, but then also identify some variants around the spike protein. So indicating that yes, there was probably Pangolin as an intermediate host, or there was a close relative there, but it, it wasn't the definitive, you know, last step before it made it the leap to the human population. So in terms of that kind of epidemiology, epidemiology and tracking, that's one um, application. Another that's, that's very common right now is, is tracking the virus and, and looking at variants in the viral population. Um, we've certainly seen over the course of the last several months, there are some variants in the in the virus itself, um, although some have gone have stopped short of calling them different strains. We are seeing there are some genetic mutations here and there, and so being able to say, well, this looks like the Europe the strain that you know came to the United States from Europe, or this looks like the strain that came from Asia, or there was a strain in the Houston area um, that was identified through genome sequencing that it had some variants that made it um, apparently more. Um, made it spread more rapidly. Um, so being able to track those, um, that type of thing is, is certainly one application. Um, and then if we move away from SARS-CoV-2, identification of novel viruses is, is another uh, great one. Um, we've certainly seen over the course of the last couple of years, groups have identified um, essentially metagenome assembled viruses. And adding those into our reference databases makes a big difference in our ability to recover information. Specifically, um, there was some work done out of University College Cork in Ireland where they identified approximately 250 novel crossphage genomes. When we add that into our reference database and start mapping to it, our crossphage recovery goes I won't say through the roof, but it increases substantially. And so suggesting that there's a lot of viral diversity out there that we just don't have good um, representation for yet. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hollister. That was a great answer. Um, Dr. Santiago Rodriguez, I think this one might be for you. Um, why were the whole viruses not represented as accurately as the free nucleic acids in the virus mock community experiment? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I think one of the issues that we had was the uh, the kit, the extraction kit that we use. Since we only use one kit, we didn't have a way to to compare the results with when using other kits. So I think in the future, it's something that we need to to do just to compare a, a number of different kits and see which one is is the best one to to recover the whole viruses. Okay, interesting and. We've got a question about capturing virome from human fecal samples using shotgun metagenomics. Do you need to do the virome enrichment step or can you just sequence total DNA directly? And Emily, I think you indicated you wanted to answer this one. Sure. Um, so in terms of sequencing DNA viruses um, in conjunction with fecal samples and shotgun metagenomics, we can offer, often recover um, DNA viruses directly without en enrichment steps. Um, Tasha will be able to comment more on the value of enrichment. Um, certainly it can help amplify that signal, but it's not always completely necessary. Yeah, I, I wanted to add, uh, it's not always necessary, but it has a caveat that you probably are going to get probably less than 1% of the reads being, being viral. So you have to also consider that when you enrich the viruses, then you're going to, to know that probably most of the uh, fraction in your sample is going to be viruses. But it's something that you have to consider. It, it has its pros and its cons. All right. Um, so we're getting a couple questions about how to partner with Diversagen. Um, I'm just going to direct people to info at 
www.dr.hollister.com. That's the fastest and quickest way to get in touch with general inquiries. You can also reach out to Dr. Hollister and Dr. Santiago Rodriguez directly. Um, and we will be following up with a recording of this presentation after the fact. Um, so lots of potential ways to get in touch about um, working with us if you have questions after. Okay, so that last question kind of got me thinking about researchers who are predominantly focusing on the microbiome, the bacterial aspect of the microbiome. Um, what are some ways that you can look at viral bacterial interactions using the microbial and viral data? Um, maybe you can comment on how, what you can do to look at the data and what is the sort of utility or use case for looking at the combined data. I'm asking you both in general, so just jump on in. Uh, so some of the things I've seen out there, it's mostly correlation. Some people get the bacterial fraction and the viral fraction and, and try to make some correlations to see any positive and negative correlations between bacteria and viruses. Uh, we have seen this with a couple of different studies uh, from some of our different clients. Um, Emily, do you have anything else? I was going to say, maybe you want to talk about the, um, the high fat diet setting. Yeah, uh, so in one of our studies um, back at uh, UC San Diego, we were looking at the, uh, the viral fractions in, in mice that were fed a high fat diet and, and those that were, were not. And we saw uh, differences in, in the viruses, lytic lysogenic cycles. And we saw mostly a shift in, in those cycles uh, towards uh, a lytic cycle in, in the mice that were fed a, a high fat diet. Okay. Um, next up, we have a question about sequencing depth. Are you able to identify viral metagenomes with shallow shotgun sequencing, or do you need a deeper sequencing depth? I can tackle this one. Um, so the answer is that it depends. And uh, it depends partly on your sample matrix of interest, um, as well as potential viral load, and whether or not you've done anything on it. Um, Tata actually just had a paper expected last night where um, she evaluated the uh, effects of shallow sequencing on information recovery using a variety of different methods and in particular included a section um, that dealt with viral recovery at, at various sequencing preps. So in general, we tell people that um, when it comes to viral sequencing, deeper is always better. Um, and that is in, certainly what the, um, the paper demonstrates is that um, as you go shallower, the signal can become more stochastic, especially in a matrix like stool. So, um, yeah, all of that to say, it depends, but keep in mind that if you're not doing enrichment and if you're looking at DNA only or even in a combined DNA, cDNA sequencing paradigm that we have used in our laboratory, typically three to five percent of your reads will be viral in nature. So um, you may pick up some of the signal, but likely not a lot if you're going shallow. Okay, thanks for that, Emily. Um, I have a few more questions. I'm just trying to see what makes sense for the conversation. Okay, this one is kind of taking a step, a level up um, and talking more about the virome in general. So is the virome composed across individuals? Are they personal um, to a person like a microbiome is? Um, are they different across body sites? Maybe a little bit more like introductory background on what the virome is for me. Sasha, you want to keep going? Yeah. Uh, so, the, so the first question, the second question was about the body sites. The first one was, can you repeat it? Sorry. Was about, is there like a personal virome concept? So each virome, each person has a different virome. Yeah, uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, and this is, uh, this is something that we noticed back when I was doing some viral research and we continue to see it that viruses tend to be very personalized. And, and even in this study that Emily mentioned that we got accepted last night, uh, we, we 
saw that a lot of these viral strains are very specific for, for each of the subjects. And, and in terms of, of body sites, we know that different body sites can have a different viral compositions. For example, you would expect to, uh, the oral cavity to have more bacterial phages infecting, for example, streptococcus species. You would imagine also that, that the skin may have more bacterial phages infecting, for example, uh, staphylococcus. Um, urine, for example, that we long thought that was sterile has a number of different human papilloma viruses. So each body site has its own um, viral communities. All right, thanks for that. So um, I'm just going to remind the audience we only have a couple more questions for Dr. Hollister and Dr. Santiago Rodriguez. So please feel free to type those in um, as we're wrapping up. Um, I have a couple of questions along the lines of database. So viral databases, do you think it matters um, what host is used or what host the, the database is designed for? So a human host versus you mentioned that there could be some applications in livestock or um, other animal species. Do you think that host matters when you're looking at the virum? I certainly think it can, um, and and depending, it depends really on how your database is developed. If you've gone for a very broad NR, you know, cat type database, trying to capture as much information as possible, or if you're trying to focus very specifically on viruses that are likely to be present in your specific host, um, we knew, we know some viruses um, can be present across. Uh, multiple uh, host species um, and some tend to be more specific. We've also seen in some of our tool testing and, and development where um, we can get a close hit uh, though it may not be a perfect match. So um, for example in some of that work with the ATCC mock community we found that uh, we could depending on the the tool and the database we used um, sometimes if the, the exact virus wasn't present, we could still get pretty close with, say, a, a monkey-related strain of the virus or a, um, a bat-related strain of the virus if it happened to be present. So yes and no, um, depending on, on how focused the database is. Oh, interesting. Um, we have another database question. Do you have any idea the percentage of viral community that is not captured in your database? That's a, is that a hard thing to measure? Kind of, we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so certainly some testing and development that we've done has indicated that each time we augment our database, we capture more information. I fully expect that there's a fair amount of viral diversity that's not captured. And, and those who work in, in the soil microbiome, environmental microbiomes will find this to be a, a very common thing um, where it's not uncommon to find that you get a, a relatively low proportion of your reads just not mapping because there's not a, a close enough relative in your database. Um, the example I gave of the crass phage mapping rate increase, um, that was based on including you know, a few hundred genomes. And, and new viruses are being identified on a regular basis. So I fully suspect that, um, you know, as, as these efforts continue, as surveillance efforts continue, and we're capturing more of these genomes, that we'll do a better job. We as a community will do a better job of, of being able to capture that information and expand the, the, the view beyond the very common, um, or at least commonly recognized pathogens and viruses that have high economic impact. All right, okay, well, we're near the end of our time, so I think I'll wrap it up so that the speakers and the audience might have a little pause in what is often a never-ending cycle of Zoom and video conference calls. So um, I wanna thank both of you so much for being with us today and sharing your vast knowledge on this topic. Um, I learned a ton. I hope the audience learned a lot. If you have questions for the speakers, they've graciously provided their email addresses. You should see them on your screen right now. We do um, encourage you to reach out. You'll also see the general 
Diversigen email address, perhaps you'd like to talk about a project with us, that's a great way to get in touch. If you're interested in learning more or trying those collection kits that Emily and Tasha uh, mentioned, you can get in touch with DNA Genotech using the link that's on the screen right now. As I mentioned, you'll all receive uh, an email with instructions on how to access the recording of this webinar. Um, that's all that we have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you all take care and stay safe and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everybody.